Uh, glad to have you here. I know a lot of you are uh, police. Uh, some of you are police. I just want you to know uh, this was my idea. <laughs> and uh, I have a red Prius and the license plate number, New Jersey. Um, hey, we've been going through the uh, 12 steps uh, just because we think there are biblical principles in the 12 steps. And we remember that step one is this, uh, 12 steps of AA. Step one is about admitting that we are powerless and our lives have become unmanageable. So step one is about control. And then step two we looked at last week, it's about admitting that we have patterns in our lives. All of us have these patterns in our lives where we're just a little bit insane. Uh, in fact, uh, we said last week that we're not totally insane, we just have a little bit of insanity. Uh, we have a little bit of insanity, things we do in life, insecurities, addictions, phobias, uh, different types of anxiety. And we don't like hearing that. In fact, we do all kinds of things to keep us from seeing the truth about ourselves. We live in denial. Now, if we have worked the steps, the first two steps, hopefully our eyes are open. We're no longer in denial. So we come to step three, and step three says this. It's about a decision to turn. So I want to give you a, a quick story. Imagine you're at the Empire State Building in New York City. You're sightseeing with your family. Uh, you're in uh, that part of Manhattan that's called the Canyon because these tall buildings are all around you. And so while you're on the observation deck with your family, you hear an explosion. It kind of knocks you off your balance. And you look down the side of the building, and in the, on the building you're on, there's a fire. You go around the other side of the observation deck. You look down, and there's the fire. It's sort of become a, a towering inferno. And then all of a sudden, the guide says, we're in serious trouble. We cannot take the elevators down. They're all closed, and there's no steps on the observation deck. We're stuck. All right, right there is step one. We admitted that we are powerless and that our lives have become unmanageable. So the first week, we admitted that our building is on fire. Now, I told you last week what my compulsions are. I have a compulsion to control. I want to control my image. I want to control others. I want to control even God. I don't like doing that, and so I feel bad about it. So then I try to control my feelings. And perhaps this week, last week, you told other people about your insanity, your compulsions. See, listen, we're all dealing with that issue. We're dealing with control issue. We, we want our mates to be a certain way. We want them to respond a certain way. We want our children to be a certain way. We want this church to be a certain way. We want our logo to be a certain way. That was humor. Um, <laughs> we want our jobs to be a certain way. We want our lives to be a certain way. But what way? Well, my way. And because of this, we have to continually pull strings, manipulate people, put pressure on people, and we go through this whole deal and we get exhausted. And it all comes from the fact that we refuse to allow God to be God. Remember, as I said last week, we're on that cliff and we just refuse to let go and let God be God. And as a result, we can never rest. We go through life, even as Christians, without a shepherd. We, we do want. We don't see the still waters. We don't see the green pastures. And so it really goes like this. 
I want to have power, so I'll take control. I will always have to be right because I have to keep control. And we kick God out. So the letting go of that rotted root on the cliff is really letting go of our control, letting go of our will. And so now we're in the center. And when we're in the center, we become God. And we get tired, we get anxious, we manipulate, we get exhausted, because it's tough being God. So we do things to avert the pain, to soften our plight. So we create diversions. So step one, listen, is just admitting that your building is on fire. All right, let's go back to the story. You're on that building, and you see in an adjacent building, there's a person on the other building, and he's looking right at you. And he has in front of him a cannon. And using this cannon, he shoots a cable over to your burning building. It's like a James Bond movie. The cable comes, hooks itself around some structure on that building, and now there's a three-inch cable spanning between what you're standing on, which is burning, and the other building. And you notice that the man who shot the cable is now coming over that cable. Not only that, this man is pushing a wheelbarrow, and he comes to you, right to you, and he says, get in. I'll take you back to safety. Well, that's step two. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could fire a cable from a place that we would want to be to the place where we are and bring us back to sanity. And step three is simply this. Get in. Make a decision. It's deciding time. Step three says, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. You see, my friend, this is the case. The God of the universe has shot across to our insane world a cable. It came from the cross of Calvary right to your life. And the Son of God stands before you and says, get in. Your life is out of control. And on top of that, you don't have the power to change it. See, this is a call upon us every day. Every day we can choose to either relax in his power, allow him to be God, or we can continue our frustrating, losing battle. If we don't get in, if we don't turn over our wills, I think it is because of one of two reasons. Here's the first. I don't accurately understand my condition, or I don't accurately understand God's character. So let's look at the first. I don't accurately understand my condition. The reason I don't get in the wheelbarrow and turn my life and my will over to him is that I really don't see the gravity of my condition. And there's several reasons that I don't. One we've already talked about, it's denial. The Bible would call it blindness. Denial says to God and his wheelbarrow, what fire? My life is fine. I'm okay. I mean, I, I smell a little smoke sometimes, but, but there's nothing serious. And by the way, you never deal with denial one time. It's not a once you do, it's gone. Denial is constant, constant. In fact, the Bible uses the word blindness. It's the inability to see our plight, our heart. Think of it as, as, as a constantly growing cataract. Every hour, I find myself slipping back into denial. It, it's just human nature 
uh, to move away from anything that's potential pain. And so we end up saying, God, thank you for coming here, but, you know, my life isn't that bad, and I'm in control most of the time. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, by the way, I'm not like those alcoholics and drug addicts that go to this church in the basement on Tuesday nights. I come here on Sunday morning. I'm here in the sanctuary. But the same problem that church basement people have is the same problem that Sunday morning people have. They're just different manifestations. One basic problem, two different expressions. We all have this capital S sin, which is control. And what makes it worse, even when we admit it, we can't even change it. Uh, this is what Paul said in Romans 7, 18. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. I'm powerless. Do you realize that, do you realize that you actually have no power to change that crazy stuff in your life? Or have you slipped back into denial? Jesus, one time speaking, he speaks about blindness, speaks about denial, and he says this in Matthew 6, 22. He says, the eye of the lamp is the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, as those cataracts are growing back, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if then the light within you is dark, how great is that darkness? So if you're on a burning building and you're saying, what fire? How great is that deception? There's a saying in AA that the worst alcoholic is the alcoholic that says he's not an alcoholic. You know, I was thinking of the invitation of the Christian message and the invitation of the people that are in 12 steps. They have one thing in common. It is for desperate people, people who are actually aware of their situation. You will never get in the barrel if you're in denial. What fire? And again, what gets us out of denial is pain, that great gift, pain. Only pain can eat through our denial. Keith Miller said it this way, can eat through the walls of denial. Pain will put you in the wheelbarrow. It's just like Peter, what he said to Jesus. He says, where are we to go? Only you have the wheelbarrow. I want you to turn, if you get a chance, or you can see it on the screen, Psalm 18.2. And be thinking of the steps, those first three steps, as we look at this psalm. The psalm starts in 18.2. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. In other words, the Lord is the one who shot the cable. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I've been saved from my enemies. The, the cords, listen to this, the cords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction have overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coil around me, and the snare of death confronted me. Is this guy in denial? No way. He sees his life burning, and look what he does. Verse 6, in my distress, it's always in our distress, it's always in our pain that we call to the Lord. He says, in my distress, I call to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. Remember the guy on the cliff? And from my temple... From his temple, he heard my voice, and out of the temple came the cable. My cry came before him into his ears. 
So one reason we don't get in the wheelbarrow is that we're not desperate. We're not desperate. Uh, we really don't see our state. And all the junky stuff that goes on in our lives is mostly private. So a lot of people don't know about your private junk. We really don't see our problem. We can get out of it, and we can stop any time. It's not that bad. I only drink late at night, and most of the time, I'm really sane. So that's one reason. We don't see our problem. The second is we don't trust the guy with the wheelbarrow. We don't trust God. Step three says this. We made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. Then it says, as we understood him. But see, that's a problem. Vast majority of people really don't understand God. We, we, we have at best, all of us, an incomplete picture of God. And much more commonly, most of us have an inaccurate picture of God. Have you ever thought about this? We were made in the image of God. We, we all know that, the Imago Dei. We, we were made in the image of God. But on the flip side, we make God and also an image. So I got to ask you, what is your image of God? See, many of us think of our God and his image is one of our earthly father. Or we make God into the image of maybe our mother. Or we make God in the image of the principal at the parochial school that we attended. Or we make God in the image of a pastor or the pastor we had in the past who, who disappointed us. Or we make God in the image of a nun who treated us so harshly in the second grade. Maybe your image of God is from your own projection. Maybe you see God as being angry because you tend to be angry. Maybe you see God as non, really unforgiving because you're unforgiving. Or maybe you see God based on your sorrow or your disappointment or your own rage. See, the problem is man has made God since the beginning of time into the image of something other than he really is. So when the wheelbarrow gets there, and we, even if we're past denial, even though we realize the building is burning, destroying our lives, but the one who says get in, we put a face on that. Whose face do you put on? Do you put on him the face of your earthly, powerless father? Or do you put on him the face of some exacting despot? See, the truth is, it has to be the God of mercy and the God of love. See, the truth is, with AA, AA people can only trust and meet a powerful and merciful God. When I was growing up in my teen years, in the early 20s, There was a popular musical group called Bread. Anybody remember that group, Bread? Some good songs. They had a, they had a song called Sweet Surrender. And it was a, about a song about a guy who stopped trying to control his heart and just surrendered. In that case, it was dealing with romance. Step three is about sweet surrender to God. And by the way, surrender is not giving up. It's giving over. It's giving over control to God. Richard Rohr writes that what you resist persists. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 39, offer the wicked no resistance. Our inner blockage to turning over our will is only overcome by a decision. 
Give to God your control. Learn to accept. Isn't that a hard thing? Just, man, just to accept things. To accept what is. To accept ourselves. To accept others. To accept our past, which means to accept our mistakes. To accept our personal idiosyncrasies. But it's so counterintuitive, isn't it? To, to, to let go seems like it's the worst advice ever. Yet that's what Jesus taught. We suffer, Jesus said, to get well. We surrender in order to win. We die so that we can live. We give it away in order to keep. So my final question is this. Are you going to get in the barrel? You want to know if you actually got in the barrel or not? I can tell you. It'll be determined by what you do in steps 4 through 12. It is the doing of steps 4 through 12 that actualize whether we did or did not get in the barrel. You realize what I'm saying now. You're not just putting in the barrel your life. You're putting in your will, your control. All right. The building is on fire. The cannon has been shot. The cable is here. The God of the universe is here with his face. And the invitation for you is to get in. Today, you decide. Remember the psalmist said this, in my pain, in my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. And from his temple, he heard my voice. Would you bow just for a moment? With every head bowed, every eye closed. All the people that are in this room, including the one behind this pulpit, has a little bit of insanity in their lives. For some, it's publicly known. For most of us, it's very private. But it's some addiction that we can't beat. Some response that just comes out of our lives, maybe out of insecurities or fear, that we have hurt people or we have carried on a huge amount of rage and we've lashed out at people we love. I want to tell you something else. There's another problem that we have. We all have a sin problem. I am a sinner. I am a sinner. And it shows itself every day, every hour in my life. Things that come through my mind I, I can't believe. My life is burning. But God, through Jesus Christ, sent a cable. From heaven to earth, there came a gift. Jesus Christ. The greatest Christmas gift. And he says, put your life in mine. Commit yourself to me. Your sins are forgiven, and we'll work on all the insanity that is still going on. You can make that decision right where you are. You simply you don't have to. Yeah, listen, this is not an invitation to become religious or to become churchy. No one likes churchy, religious stuff. This is a relationship. This is a relationship. This is where you can get out of the center of your life allow God to come in, and all of a sudden you find he's a loving, gracious shepherd that wants nothing but the best for you. Father, your light has burned away the, the cataracts. Blindness for many of us has been taken away, and we respond to you. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.